Hi, everybody. I'm David Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. I just brought Jones, my son, down here yesterday to the basement. We were here for dinner. And, and I walked in. I was like, he was like, wait, I want to see where you guys film. So I brought him here. And he really, he just did that same introduction. He was like, hi, I'm David Butler. And I'm Emily Freeman. And he just goes through. So sorry if you're sick of that intro. I don't, I don't know how else to say hi besides that. So... Anyways, awesome. welcome, welcome. Um, we are, we, this is a scripture study podcast. We moved through this year, the Old Testament, following the Come Follow Me curriculum, hopefully giving you um, insights, ideas for your own personal study, and then also as you share and, and teach and study with groups and families and classes and, and stuff like that. So we're excited that you're here. Um, it's been fun. I feel like I've met a ton of people. Yeah. This week, especially. So fun. We're part of this family, and yep. it's just, uh, it's yeah. really That's cool. That's our favorite part. Yeah. We love meeting you. Um, and I, people come up all the time and they're like, you said you love meeting us. Yeah, so that's why I'm do. saying hi. And this week, somebody stopped me because they were like, um, hey, I, I know your voice. Yes. And they'd never seen like our faces before because they're podcast listeners. I think a lot of, Y'all are like that. Speaking of, we are putting a lot of thought into our podcast people for next year, our journal for next year, how to make it um, really helpful and useful for YouTube watchers and podcast yep. listeners together. So, so yeah. um, good anyways. things coming. Yeah. Lots of good things coming. All right, y'all. Today, we are jumping into a five-week series, four-week series. It's five or four. It's five. I can't remember. It's five. Um, on the book of Isaiah. So we are super excited about this. That's not fake excitement. We really are. Yeah, we actually <laughs> really love the book of Isaiah. And we want you to love the book of Isaiah when we're done. And so our hope is just to help you love reading it and love teaching it by the time we are done teaching you. I, my first experience with Isaiah came when I was like 16 years old. And our whole stake was going to read the Book of Mormon it for the summer. That's what we had decided. Except they removed the Isaiah chapters from the reading because they thought it would be easier if we just read all the way through, not Isaiah, which then made my 16-year-old brain want to be like, what do they not want us to see it's in like Isaiah? It's like a restricted, <laughs> like... <laughs> So then I was like... Did you go to the back of the video stores too? To the restricted section? My mom, why are we not reading Isaiah? And she was like, because it's so hard. We don't want everybody to quit at the beginning of the reading. And then that was like game on for me because I was like, how hard could it be? Really? (laughs) And I've loved Isaiah ever since. So we're going to give you some of our favorite um, study tips for Isaiah and some of Nephi's, because he's also really good at giving study tips as we jump in today. And then we're going to actually give you five things to consider as you're teaching your family or if you teach a Sunday school class, how you might want to introduce Isaiah. Yeah, the re- I mean, I think you look at other prophets, they write in a similar way to Isaiah. Uh, Jeremiah, for example, I think mm. is super, super similar. But the only reason we don't talk about him is because no one reads Jeremiah. Yes. But Isaiah... We know like deep down, well, not just deep down, but like because Jesus recommends it. And yeah. Nephi spends so much time on the small plates to Talking Isaiah, about which it. is supposed to be like the precious like hand-picked sections. Yeah. And and so there's something about it that we're drawn to feel like, oh, we I think got to understand this for some reason. Right. And both Nephi in the Book of Mormon quotes it and Jesus quotes him right. um, so many times that there is something that is meant for us in Isaiah. Particularly... For this day, for the mm-hmm. latter days, yeah. right? And so it's worth the effort to try and understand him because he re- it's like right, reading Shakespeare. You know, he, it's in English, but you're like, what are you even saying? And like, it just takes a little bit, you know, longer to kind yeah. of like process through. And so we're actually going to start with Nephi. Um, and when he's done quoting the words of Isaiah, he kind of says like, listen, he recognizes, I know this is like really hard for people to understand because he's so poetic and flowery and, and just apocalyptic almost. Yeah. Um, and he gives like his own tips to readers on how to read Isaiah. Um, first, let's put the first thing on the on the on this guy. 
And I love um, what we chose for this is actually just a picture of Jesus. Cake. Because for me, the first reading of Isaiah, so this is, if this is your first reading of the book of Isaiah, um, the first time I read it, I just looked for Jesus everywhere. That's it. I didn't try and understand anything. I just looked for references and descriptions of the character and attributes of Jesus Christ. And so we are starting with this because that might be how you want to enter into your study of Isaiah this time. Um, and this this goes in box 37, by the way. Um, I think this is neat that it's a picture of him carrying mm. this girl because there's a lot of language in here about the Lord bringing down judgment upon the wicked. And it kind of goes contrary to like this image initially when you read it. Yeah, especially but, as you begin, as you enter into Isaiah, as we leave Isaiah, you're going to get a lot of scriptures talking about the brokenhearted and um, grace, a lot of scriptures about grace, but that's not going to be until our very last week. So I think it's good to keep in mind as we get into some of the harsh themes of Isaiah, that this is where Isaiah is going to end. Yeah, or also that this is the character of mm. God throughout the entire thing. Yes. Like that when you read something that you're like, whoa, I, w I didn't think God would do something like that, punish in that way. You're like, oh, there is a tender reason behind everything that's happening. Mm. So that's it's good so to just good. keep that in mind as you yeah. go through. So we thought we would start in 2 Nephi 25. Um, and just introduce Isaiah the way Nephi introduces Isaiah because it's our favorite way. And this is our week of becoming introduced to Isaiah. So Nephi is going to say right at the very beginning, I'm going to talk a little bit concerning um, words that have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah because he spake many things and they were hard for my people to understand because they did not know concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews. So I love that even Nephi is like, Isaiah is hard to understand. And one of the clues for understanding is to understand the manner of prophesying among the Jews as we get into it. And he says this in verse four, because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless, they are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. And we love that idea too, of just being filled by the spirit as you read. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail. And in the book of Revelation, it tells us the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So keeping that in your heart as you start reading of, um, I, I feel like when I go in, if I can be like, oh, I know Jesus. And because I know Jesus, these words connect with me is a really great way of going in to Isaiah. And also there's something about, I, I got this advice from a friend of mine who's a patriarch and he said, when you read your patriarchal blessing, you want to try and capture the same spirit the patriarch had when he gave it. To mm. not get so caught up on individual words, but like what's the idea and the feeling that he was trying to convey mm. here? And I also think there's something you know, there where you're yes. just like, God has a message for me, for you through these words of Isaiah. And that's what we're trying to capture. Like what's the, what is it that God wanted me, us, all mm -hmm. of us to know? This is how it got delivered is in Isaiah style, but yep. I'm, I'm trying to get to the heart and soul of what the message is. And I love when Nephi says in verse five, um, I my soul delights in the words of Isaiah because I came from Jerusalem and my eyes have beheld the things of the Jews. And that really is true. Like we, we spent some time in Jerusalem this summer. And um, I love that thought where he's like, I came out of Jerusalem. And I think there is something about coming out of that place or those places where you have come to know Jesus Christ that will also make you delight in Isaiah. And that might be the literal land of Jerusalem, but that might also just be those places where you walked where the Savior walked, where you learned a lesson personal to you from the Savior will help you to delight in Isaiah. And then he says- Well, and also with that, one of our things is like study helps and we, like most of us haven't mm -hmm. come from that land. Like we don't know the countries that he's talking about, you know, like 
in in 300 years from now if somebody says russia ukraine like we you know they would be like i don't know like anything about what's happening but if they're talking we'd be like oh my gosh i remember i know yeah, that i know what's i happening. know that conflict mm-hmm. i know what's happening there and so um that's going to be one of you know the tips there is because they were like, going to help I'm, you yeah, figure like, out from, how to do i'm from here that's why i like it because like mm-hmm. these are com- in fact this might be fun to know that Isaiah's as far away from Nephi as Joseph Smith is from us. So, like, if you want, like, time-wise, like, you know, yeah. how we, like, ca- kind of understand, like, Joseph Smith's world a little bit, you know, or yes. just, like, similar, you know? Yeah, so Nephi would have understood Isaiah's world yeah. in the same way, right. which that's so awesome to think about. Um, I love in verse 7, I feel like this is a real promise for us when it says... In the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. Wherefore, they are of worth. Um, Because, he tells us in the end of verse 8, in that day shall they understand them. Wherefore, for their good, I have written them. And I love reading that and thinking to myself, Okay, we are born in the last days. And so we've been given an added gift to be able to recognize the prophecies that are being talked about here. So it it makes it fun to read because I want to know the prophecies. So when they come to pass, I'm like, oh, that's in Isaiah. Yeah, and it's kind of fun that just like Nephi is like, wait, that's the world I live in. We can say like, oh, this is the world I live in. And that's why I'm going to like have a particular fondness you know for them because i'm like oh i i see this being fulfilled right now and happening so a couple things we wanted to do as we start um first of all if you have the tip in for this week it's just five ways to understand isaiah um i i'm just keeping mine here so every time i get into isaiah i can think oh this is how i'm going to study isaiah this time so first watch for the verses that testify of christ Um, if that is the only way you read isaiah ever your testimony of Jesus Christ will be strengthened. That's my favorite way to read Isaiah. Um, Second, watch for the verses of counsel and warning. We'll look at some of those today. Third, watch for prophecies relevant for our day. So like, what do you see happening that has to do with us? Fourth, read with the Spirit. And fifth, you study helps. And we're gonna go through some of those today. And we thought what would be awesome Um, would be to just take these one by one. Um, I think it's hard to read Isaiah. It's even harder to teach Isaiah. And as we were thinking about how did we want to teach this lesson, one of the things we thought is we might show you how we would actually teach each of these things. If we were going to pick one of these, we're going to go through, we're going to clean off the board every time, and we're going to say, if we were going to ponder the symbols, this is what that would look like. If we were looking for what is relevant for our day, this is how we would teach something like that um, as we go through. So David's going to wipe off the board. We're going to start with the first one, which is ponder the symbols. If you have the journal, you're going to be able to record the whole lesson under each of these um, places in the journal where we will be writing um, what we learn. Um, from this. So we're going to ponder the symbols and we thought we would start in Isaiah. Um, We're going to go to chapter three because it's one of our favorite symbol chapters. Um, Let me go to Isaiah now because, um, okay, so I call this part the part about the tinkling women. Does anyone else (laughs) <laughs> want to call it that. It's <laughs> my favorite because they were mincing and tinkling as they go. So no, it's the poor tinkling Isaiah. Women. Today, tinkling just means different. So when we see the tinkling <laughs> women, I'm like, this is so <laughs> true. Okay, Isaiah 3, and we're going to start in 16. So uh, if I was teaching this lesson, and it's so fun to watch when this happens, the first thing you want to do is draw just a stick figure picture of a woman or a girl. But she needs a neck. Well, there. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone who's on a podcast, I'm drawing the best picture of a woman there ever was. She needs hands. Okay. And feet. Um, 
Okay, so. She's Bart Snowman. <laughs> one of the things that you want to do when you're reading Isaiah is he's going to use a lot of big words and a lot of symbols. So he's going to describe the daughters of Zion that are living. And he's going to start out, start out and say they're haughty and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Her neck just got longer. Um, wanton eyes feel like they want to look at everything. Mm -hmm. Is that what they are? No, she looks like she has a beard, but it's fine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, sometimes what is really helpful to do is um, when you're reading in the King James Version, um, it might help to get a different version to read with so that when you start reading words that have to do with... Um, the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon and their chains and their bracelets and their mufflers, which all of a sudden you start thinking we're building a car instead of uh, dressing a woman. I'm going to read that same thing, but I'm going to take you into the English Standard Version. So it's going to um, start out and say, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes and mincing as they go and tinkling with their feet. Um, then he's going to go through and describe what these ladies look like. So he says they have finery of anklets and headbands and crescent bracelets and pendants and scarves. And headdresses, oh, that got exciting, and sashes, Ooh, Miss America, Miss America sash, perfume boxes, oh, she's spraying, yeah. and um, amulets, which are the high arm bracelets, and then she needs signet rings on her fingers. And also she has a nose ring. Fun. And she needs festal robes. And mantles and cloaks. And she needs a handbag. <laughs> also, and then a mirror in her other hand. And linen garments. And a turban. <laughs> and a veil. Okay, how did he do, everybody who's not listening on the podcast? <laughs> what do you think about the Daughters of Zion? Um, when I teach this, I love to say to people, name me one word to describe this woman. And then I'll list them underneath. Um, because the words are always so good, and it really does make you think about these tinkling women walking and mincing as they go and just um, adorned. Uh, the word I like to think of is excess, so mm. maybe you would write that. Um, and I think like this is the point of like pondering a symbol is like he's like it's a list. Like he's not saying. He's painting a picture here of somebody who's just over the top. And, it's, and he's trying to create a, a feeling here instead of like, um, oh, I have a problem with bracelets yeah. and I have a problem with That's rings. That's so good. And he's not pointing fingers at jewelry right. or clothing necessarily. But it's like, oh, the idea is excess or one word I thought of as I was like actually drawing it is just sort of like... Um, like compensating, like this mm. one, like you're like, why are you so like overcompensating? Yeah, overcompensating for yeah, something that's so like good. You what should write is that. it that you're, you know, and that's what's awesome about doing this. It's also a really good tip, by the way, to look at yourself instead of other people when you read this because yes. it's really easy to be like, oh, I know someone who tinkles um, or whatever, you know, but yeah. it's like, wait, where do where I, am I, am I, do I have an excess? Is there something about me that's extra? Is there something about me that's overcompensating in mm. some way? So yeah. that's so good. And what he says is what will eventually happen to 
someone like this, then he's going to describe it still in Isaiah 3. Um, what will happen is instead of a sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. And if we were to go into the ESV and read that part, I love when it says this, instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. And instead of a belt, a rope. Um, and instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. And it helps us to know when we use those words um, that there's going to be a rope and baldness and sackcloth and branding. Those would be words that would hint of, you write it, bondage. Um, that instead of... Um, what maybe someone would want to say, the abundant life. I love that he's like, no, actually what this is going to lead to is bondage. And um, if I was teaching this class, whether it was to adults or to, I love teaching this class to teens because there's such a lesson here of like, why? Why would this eventually lead to this? And for some reason, when I can see it visually, the lesson becomes so much more profound. I don't know what, what you've taught this also to teens and, and what's your favorite part? Yeah. Well, and just the idea again, it's just like what happens when all of that is taken away, right? That if, if a person relied on all of this excess and extra things for their worth and value, what happens when they're all hmm. gone? Like what is left? And it's just like, oh, baldness and like stench, like those aren't the things of, you know, actual, actual beauty. And, and it's, it's also a cool symbol of the Lord saying, I'm, I am going to take away, you know? Yeah, because he does in verse, stuff. in chapter four, what's going to happen? He's going to start out in um, Isaiah four, four, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. And I just, I love that thought. In fact, you could even do it right now of just washing this away. That, that's what he's going to do when he comes. Again, is he's just going to wash all of this away. And um, it will happen by the Spirit, which I love that too. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud of smoke by day and the sh shining of a flaming fire by night. And there shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from the storm and from rain. And I love this thought of just even this being removed. And if you were just to now make that daughter of Zion again, and um, the, the Lord's going to wash all of that away from her with the spirit. That's what's going to happen. And... There's so many references here to temple, and I, it would be so awesome to just um, put her within the temple because it talks about the spirit will be there and that it's a tabernacle and a place of refuge from the storm and from rain. And I love that as we look at the symbolism only in three and all of four, this is what we end with is this. And when you think about all three of those pictures now, which is the one you want and why? Like, what does this represent symbolically um, to you? And, and those words that maybe you would write under there that just talked about dwelling places and spirit and defense and refuge and covert. And like, that's what I want in my life is that. Yeah, and it's interesting that, like there seems to be, this is a this is a theme that Isaiah will use again and again and again, and we'll come back to it. And it's just almost sets up a, a choice. Like, what is it in this particular example? What do you want to be clothed and covered by? Hmm. You know, the excess of the world. It seems like you want to be like have that security, the attention, whatever it is, what all to fill and be covered with that, or do you want to be covered by His? 
protection, his fortress. And it's, it's, mm. it's, Isaiah sets up, who are you going to trust? What are you going, what kind of um, relationships are you going to lean into? Who's attention are you trying to like mm-hmm. draw to yourself and he's just like this is what happens when uh, you know on this end and this is and this is what can happen on this end yeah which i just love yeah. so symbols you might want to teach with symbols um the second thing we talk about is what am i learning about jesus so we're going to invite you to go to isaiah 12 right now And we're going to do another, just one of the ways we would teach this. So if you were going to focus your class or your discussion with your family on just looking for Jesus within Isaiah, um, here's something we would maybe do. This is is something that we love doing. Um, We would just have everybody have a piece of paper, or you can do it with your scriptures. And as we read through Isaiah chapter 12, I would turn on some music. I would let people read independently, but since we have podcast people on here, I'm going to read it for you so you are with us as we are thinking. And I would suggest looking for anything that teaches of Christ or his character or his attributes. Would you add anything when you do this in your class that they might want to set it up with? Uh, no, at the end, I'll say something because of a phrase that's in there mm. and maybe another way to uh, approach this, but. Okay. So but, we yeah. would just turn on music, which we're going to do. I'll read it. Um, so you can be thinking and you're just looking for anything that teaches you about Christ. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Um, okay, one of the things I would say is um, this is when you read the chapters that are leading up to this, like you see the Lord kind of, you know, breaking down the high walls, taking away mm-hmm. like all of the thing, all the ornaments off of people and and rescuing everyone from those things that, you know, that they became obsessed with. And this is the song that they sing after the rescue. This is them looking back and saying, oh, you know, th- thank you for, for everything that you did. And, and I love that it starts the I will praise thee. And we did this with the Psalms, but that idea in verse four of um, declare his doings, make mm. mention of his name and, and sing for he has done excellent things. And so I, I, I just think it would be really cool to, you know, to mention some of those excellent things Mm, and even it's it's kind of neat to contrast it with like um what we just saw with that lady like this is what let's say that's like a he's trying to create an image of this is what the world can offer you yeah that you can be covered with all of this or what if we made another list that said or this is what your life can be filled with in in covenant relationship with with the lord and so I think in part, this is a millennial song. Like, mm. let's look back and s- talk about all the excellent things. But, like, I think about that it could have a fulfillment right now for yeah. me, you know? He's rescued me already. Like, where where have I seen his hand? Where have I seen that comfort and strength and, and yeah, courage and right come? Right in his midst over there, uh, in the midst of the... Um, Yeah, because that is what I love is when you look through here and you start pulling out those words. He is comfort. He is strength. He helps you to not be afraid. He is joy. He does excellent things that you could, they're talked about all over the earth. He's in the midst. Like this is who 
Jesus is. And there's something about, for me at least, laying the words out so I can see. I mean, there's so many more. I just started putting up a few, but so that you can see this is who he is. This is his character is such a great lesson. And I was going to say for your little kids, this seems like something they would relate to. Yeah. And if someone's a little bit older, you could say, okay, like take verse two, um, tell me how he's been a strength, you know, for you. And tell me how he's been a song. Like, what does, what do songs do, you know, for you? Like, why would someone say, he's like my favorite song? Yes. You know, and how has he become a salvation? And obviously you can think about, you know, where, where he conquered death and sin, but what, what has he saved you from? Like, what is, you know, what has he mm-hmm. protected you from? There's so many more things here that. Um, yeah. Where has he brought you joy? Right. What excellent thing has he done in your life? Lately. So this is just like a worshipful section, Isaiah 12. Yeah. I was just talking to my Sunday school class that I teach last week and just saying, because we were doing the Psalms, and it was, you know, what this idea of the, the soul like really needs opportunities to praise, right? To, to like mm-hmm. be captured by the goodness of God. Because like you look at that woman, right? Um, with all the ornaments and everything. And there's an allure there. Like there's a draw to Mm. those types of things. It like captures your heart and your imagination. And it's like, we've got to create another kind of allure, something Mm. else that can capture someone's heart. We can't paint God as the rule giver and the one who gets mad at you if you don't do what he asked you to do. But we have to talk about the, the excellent things and the miracles yeah. and like the salvation and, and the, the strength and the joy that comes from relationship with him. Like something's got to draw your heart away from worldliness because it has a really strong pull and, yeah. and grab. And I think chapters like this are great for that to just say like, oh, let's just talk about like these yeah. are the words of someone who's encountered salvation mm. through Jesus. Like this is what... Yeah comes out of them. Yes, which I love. And and that may be where you spend most of your time is just looking for in Isaiah, where are the words that testify of Christ and keep a list of all of those. Um, the third thing is what is relevant for our day. And we're going to take you to two chapters. I'm going to do Isaiah 2. David's going to do Isaiah 11 right after me. But if you were going to look for something that felt relevant to our time and a lesson that might be taught from that, then um, maybe you would go to Isaiah 2. And um, you might want to start with, um, I would just draw these two symbols on the board, the world and then the temple. Um, Maybe would be what I would focus on. And first I would list how Isaiah describes uh, the world. And I would just list it right under here. So I'm going to start in Isaiah 2. And um, I will start in verse six. So therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth not down. And um, you might want to look at the footnote for mean. Um, It it says ordinary. The ordinary man doesn't humble himself. And the great man also does not humble himself. So there's just so much pride. Um, There's so much stuff. Um, I love... Um, work is something I probably would put down there. They're just so obsessed with uh, work. Um, and, and that is what this looks like. And when I read those things, I want to think to myself, where do I see that in our, in our world, but also where do I see it in my world um, right now? And compare that to what we see at the first um, of chapter two of Isaiah, because this is our time. He tells us, this is your time. This is what it's going to look like. 
But this also is our time. And he, he says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall go and say, Come, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And um, I love when he says what the benefit of that will be is that they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Think what that would look like. Uh, like their weapons are going to be changed to become uh, places where growth can come out of. And they won't learn war anymore. Um, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And I love that he kind of sets up in the last days, there's going to be this, but also in verse six, there's going to be this and you get to choose which place you want to live. And um, this is relevant to us. We live in the last days. So I love him just setting up for us. I can see your time. And there's going to be two places you can live in. One's going to look like this and one will look like this. And which one are you drawn to? And then what does that actually look like in someone's story? Right. And there's something really interesting at the end of two, after it talks about this, it says, when the Lord shows his glory, um, it just says this, starting in 17, the loftiness of man will bow down and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And it says, and, and the fear of the Lord and, and for his glory and majesty, it will cause people to just shake. And it says in 20, that they'll cast all their idols of silver and gold, which they made uh, into the uh, caves where the moles and the, and the bats are. And, and it makes me think like just the idea of if this depiction isn't causing me to want to like throw this away, then, then, I, then this is not being presented Right, like then the glory of God hasn't quite rested in you yet. In me yet, I, I can remember coming home from um, a fireside that I was at in high school, and coming home and then going to my CD like little zipper thing, mm -hmm. you know, and I actually like threw away like several of the CDs that I had because what I learned there mm. made me think like, wait, I want to, I want to like my, I want my allegiances to be different from now on, like what was presented there was good news. It was the glory of, of God. It was like, what, you know, what, what can happen? What your you know? soul was longing right. for. Right, and, and I would just say- Which and, we all know your soul. It wasn't a list of rules. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. It was you know? the goodness of God. Right, right, and yeah. I think that's what it means when it says, so if we jump over to Isaiah 11, this is, often time used as a um, millennial chapter. And it, mm. and it is, it is. And one and thing that will- And by millennial, you don't mean a generation of people, you mean a- Oh, yes. The millennium. The millenniums. But it's also mm. for the millennials, right? <laughs> because that's the beauty of Isaiah, is he has, there are multiple fulfillments to the things that he is talking about. For instance, in the beginning, it talks about, at the end of chapter 10, this whole forest is like- um, torn down and broken, everything's broken down. And in the beginning of 11, there's new growth mm -hmm. that comes out of it. And there's multiple fulfillments to that. One is it's a prophecy of Christ, like growing up out of the, out of the line of David, like this new growth will, will come, like the kingdoms will be decimated of yeah. Judah and Israel, but a new growth is, is, is going to come up. There's also a prophecy it could be fulfilled with Moroni actually reads this to Joseph Smith the night he comes to visit him in his room. And he says, Isaiah 11 has not been fulfilled yet, but it's about to be. Um, that's another fulfillment, right? That God will cause new growth, a restoration to come up out of, of the ground and it will turn people back to him. But there's a, also a fulfillment in me hmm. when God's taken a chance to tear down some of the things in my life then all of a sudden there's an opportunity for something new and beautiful to grow, you know, up yeah. out of that. And and you and you see that 
right there in the beginning and more verses about who he is in verses two and three and four that he'll approach things not the way the world does, that he'll make things right, that he'll be clothed in goodness and righteousness. And then it goes into this description where it says in verse six, the wolf will not dwell, I mean, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. They'll live together at the same house. It used to be that the wolf wanted to huff and puff and blow down his house. And now that he gets to have a room there and the leopard with the kid, meaning the little goat and the calf and the young lion and the cow and the bear shall feed and the young ones will lie down together with them. They'll eat straw together and the children will be able to play in the holes of poisonous snakes. And, and like, yes, there won't be any animosity with animals one day, but it seems to be painting a different mm. picture there of like, um, there, the contention won't be there anymore. And prejudice, prejudice won't be there, won't be there anymore. Um, the law of the jungle, which was, you know, eat, drink and be merry, take whatever you can, stomp on whoever you want so that you can get ahead. Like the law of the jungle is not here. There's no more victims. There's nobody preying on anybody mm. anymore. Like, and obviously it is describing what that millennial day will look like because it says, verse nine, they will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The reason it's going to turn this way is because people are going to know who he actually is and what he's actually like. The knowledge of him and what he's done and the attributes of him will fill the world. And that's what will cause this worldwide. It's just neat to think mm -hmm. that it can cause that in me. If I'm full of the knowledge of who he is, then yeah, all, all of that this goes away. Animosity, prejudice, um, any of those things right, right. will will be removed from you. Right. Um, so it's just uh, it's just neat to like think of. Uh, chapter eleven is a fantastic one to read all the way through because it's going to talk about like and how does that come about? Well, it's going to come about by the gathering of Israel mm -hmm. of bringing and and it's cool. Those are connected to each other yeah. because it's like. You're gathering people to the knowledge of who he is. That's what gathering means. Mm. It means, let me introduce you to Jesus. The Jesus I know. The Jesus I know. And then it's going to cause people to say like, wait, I want to enter into relationship with someone like that. Yeah. And then when I enter into a relationship with someone like that, this is what it looks like. These are the effects. Yeah, I was right? listening to a song yesterday that was so good. In fact, I think it's on our Old Testament playlist um and there's one line that says when they see me will they see you which i was like i just love the thought of that that if we have a knowledge of christ then when someone sees me they should see him in me and don't you love the thought of that yeah and i know we keep coming back to that crazy lady that we drew at the beginning and i did and i don't mean to i don't think she's the i mean Really, she's the simple, because she's called the daughters of Zion, yeah. right? Which should be, you the know, church. something different. Yeah. And it's like, but isn't it cool that it says, and he will wear righteousness mm. will be the girdle of his loins. Like the clothes he's going to have on are going to be his attributes. Yes. And it's just interesting to see some of those like. Yeah, what if we put those on? Right. Instead. His attributes yeah, on instead. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Um, that's really good. Okay, and should we just say this line real quick before yeah. we jump in? Isaiah 11, 12, don't miss this one. When he just says, set up an ensign for the nations and, that, and, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. And I think that's one other thing that happens is that like all of a sudden there are no outcasts. When mm. someone's full of the knowledge of the Lord, they realize like everyone's welcome. All are a part yep. of this. I love getting rid of the idea of outcasts. Yep, that's, that's so, cool. so good. And while you start talking about study helps, I'm going to write some of them up here. Oh, okay. Um, so that if people want a list, we've got it. Okay, so we're going to jump into Isaiah 9 as an example for kind of using different study helps. Um, we've already done this once already, and so let's, but let's just mention it again. A fantastic way to 
study Isaiah in an easy, free way <laughs> um, is to read another translation of the Bible alongside the King James. I think Isaiah wrote more King James E because it preserves too. a lot of that beautiful language and poetic language. So a lot of times it's really great to read another translation of the Bible for understanding's sake to see like, oh, that's the image he's trying to portray and show. And then come back to King James and read it in the really pretty language also. But it's really helpful to at least understand what the verse is saying. Yep. And so know? an easy way to do that without having to buy a book of scripture would be um, to, to search Isaiah, what are you going into? Well, I was just looking, I was just going to show this Bible app. Yeah. And before that, though, let's show this. So if you were just going to do Isaiah, what are, who are you nine. doing? Nine. If you just typed into Google Isaiah nine, and then you wrote ESV, um, if it's your first time using a translation, you're probably going to love the ESV the most because it most closely mirrors King James language. Um, the other one we would suggest would be the NIV. And you can just Google that. So you would just write Isaiah 9 ESV, and it would just come up, and then you can put your scriptures out and have that and read verse by verse. They'll just match up. But some of the word choices, it's like reading it with a thesaurus. That's what it's going to feel like for you. Um, the NIV would be the same. And if you just want a practice today without having to download an app, that's going to be the easiest way. To try. Yeah. Second easiest would be. Yeah, you can just get an app and then let me just show it right up here. It's going to be backwards on this, but that Holy Bible app has a whole bunch of um, translations. Also, when you Google, you're going to come across, um, it's an app or just a website called Bible Hub. Bible we Hub love has Bible a Hub. ton of different translations on it, but it also has a lot of different commentary, which is another thing that we suggest when studying, you know, when studying Isaiah. And P.S., like you can dip into this as much as you want, obviously, because some people are really going to want to dive into a great study of it and go through chapter by chapter. And some people are just going to want to dabble in this and come back another time in their life and say like, what, what is it that was so um, amazing about, you know, the words of, of Isaiah? You just might not have time this year to really jump in, but you could dabble with it easily on some of um, on some of these types of things right here. So um, an example of, of kind of that. Oh, and one other thing I was going to say. Did you talk about commentaries yet? Yeah, also commentaries, right? Some, like on Bible Hub, you'll see some that are there, but then you can also search. Yeah, well, if you some... do, Desert Book has a whole bunch of commentaries you can go to. If you just walked in and said, I want a commentary on Isaiah, um, there are going to be some there. Um, but my favorite that I use um, and still use is by uh, the Perry brothers, Donald and Don and why can't I think of his brother's name? But P A R R Y, I love theirs. Michael Wilcox has one. Uh, you you could just do the Valletta, the Old Testament study. My new um, favorite one Ogden. is. Um, I love. Um, my new favorite's Carrie Mulestein's one, Learning to Love Isaiah. Um, he pulls in a lot of these other sources together into that into one, which that is one. really nice. So all of those are good. The other thing that we love to use is something that is called a study Bible. And you can get that on Amazon. Um, I would recommend either the King James Version study Bible or um, the ESV study Bible. But what is going to happen there is where we normally have um, our footnotes that are going to send you somewhere within the scriptures, their footnotes of a study Bible only um, are going to are going to give you help you understand what is a mantle, what is a um, what what would sackcloth actually represent? They're going to go through and define for you words that are within that chapter. Um, so and I love those those yeah. study Bibles. And then the footnotes of our own Bible are going to also be as helpful. You'll notice in Isaiah, you have a ton of footnotes um, here just because the footnotes are going to try and help you understand in Isaiah better. Including a lot of uh, JST yep. that's in there also. 
And sometimes you, you, comparing it to the when there's a Book of Mormon chapter equivalent. So again, there's so much that you that we have available that you could dive in and jump into. Let me let's maybe try and illustrate why you might like that. Um, in Isaiah nine, it start. Listen how it starts. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And after did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And you're sort of like, and what's verse, it's happening? Dumb. Like I would, no one ever picked that for their missionary plaque verse yeah. because it doesn't even make any sense and nobody knows what's happening. But if you read that in another translation, if you get some help from a study Bible, um, if you get some help from a commentary, then you sort of find out historically what is actually going on because he's talking about his own current events. And what's going on right now is you have got, um, remember the two kingdoms are split from each other, Israel up in the north and Judah down in the south. Well, Israel up north has aligned themselves with Syria and are trying to get Judah to join with them. And Judah's like trying to figure out what am I going to do? They don't have a very good king. And Isaiah is saying, what's going to happen is your the trade route that's right there in the lands of Zebulon and Naphtali are going to be like attacked and, and someone's going to try and conquer those. That's what that nation's going to come in and take over it. And so you have got these people living in a time period where there's like, I have no right choice. If I go with them, they're my enemy. If I go with them, they're my enemy. The people who are living there are waking up every morning thinking at any time, this whole nation could be conquered and could I, I could lose my home tomorrow. The economy is like teetering like this. We have got a leader who is erratic, who is going to like just make a crazy decision tomorrow that could like, and I mean, they're just living in this like, not, nothing is secure, nothing is nice. I actually now feel like I'm describing, <laughs> you know, where you're like, the oh, world today because yeah, we have like, so many leaders making crazy decisions. Yeah, and, you and don't you're know like, what's no one knows happen. what the news tomorrow is going to be, and yeah. how like it feels like everything could just like fall down in a day, right? Yeah, and it's like that's what they are living in. That verse one, if you know the history, you're just like, ah, that's what it's like. But he says. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And all of a sudden, verse two is this, but there is hope. Mm. There is hope in this story. And a verse that you know really well, it says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government and all the decisions are going to be upon his shoulder. And what's he going to be like? A wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And it's this message of like, oh, if you know the history of like, they live in this mm -hmm. like really turmoil, but it's like, but then there's this message of hope that comes in. Yeah, and um, to find that history, commentaries would help you, study Bibles would help you, or... Um, even just getting on Bible Hub on the internet, and there will be commentaries there that are like, this is why he's mentioning this and this and this that will help um, all this make more sense. The other thing, too, as you read Isaiah, that is a study help is to realize that um, what you're looking for within Isaiah. And Isaiah is going to present the problem, the cure, the hope, and the consequence Uh over and over again. He's going to lay out the problem for us. We can be watching for that. But I love that he's going to lay out the cure for us also, that there, we're going to see the consequence and we're going to also see the cure and we're going to see the hope. And one of the places we see that really well is in Isaiah 1. So if you wanted to go through Isaiah 1 and say, um, what's, what's the problem? What's the consequence of that problem? What's the cure? So maybe you don't have to experience the consequence. And where is the hope? And I'm just going to read you the cure because I love it in Isaiah 1. It's in verse 16. Um, and it says this, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, 
Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And just when we think about those, the daughter that we laid out here, don't you want to just start with like, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil. I just love that he's like this. There is a cure for this. And this is what the cure looks like. So um, study helps will help us be able to understand. Uh, we won't, in a first read, know that there's going to be consequences and cures and all of those things, but there are people who can help um, walk us through that. Michael Wilcox is, is the one who pointed that out for me, that start watching for these four things in Isaiah. And that made it so much easier for me to read Isaiah. And then uh, the last thing that you need to know about Isaiah is he is a poetic writer. He, he's figurative. He's going to use language that is dressed up language and is going to help us to be able to see things. But if we don't remember that it's poetry, sometimes it can be really confusing. Um, chapter six is an example of that. And one of the ways to help read poetic scripture, the book of Revelation is the same as this, is to ask for the Spirit to be with you before you even start so that the Spirit can help bring that poetry, um, help you make a visual of it, of what am I meant to be learning here. And chapter six is a really great example of that where it just starts out. And, and, and I would also say before you start reading that in addition to that, to just try again and What's the feeling that he's trying to invoke with this? Don't get caught up in the specifics of it mm. as much as like, almost like live it, experience yeah. it. like And see it. See it. Yeah. Be in it with him. Yes. Be in right? it. I love that so much. Like put yourself in what he's describing visually for you. And this one starts out and, and it does feel hard to understand. Um, he's going to talk about the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train is filling the temple and above it stands the seraphims. Each has six wings with two they cover their face and with two they cover their feet and with two they fly and they cry to each other and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And there is all of this big and beautiful language. But when you read it, you're like, what is even happening here? And this happens to be one of David's all-time favorite chapters in Isaiah. And tell us why. Like, what do you see when you put yourself in that place? Well, what happens is it's a story of Isaiah, but like when you get into it with him is when you start to like feel like, oh my gosh, I told, like I'm you in the story. Mm -hmm. Like I can see myself in this. And he's in this, in the temple, in a, in a holy place, and these angels are praising God and the whole place is shaking. And his response in verse five is, woe is me. <laughs> He's like, oh my gosh, I should not be here. I do not belong in this holy throne room. And he says, I'm undone. I, I, like, <laughs> he says, I, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he just says, like he's centering all of kind of like the problems and his sins and shortcomings of his people symbolically into his into his lips. And he's just like, I, I absolutely do not belong in this place at all. And then all of a sudden, one of the seraphim, it says in verse six, starts flying to him with a live coal in his hands um, that he'd taken off the tongs of the altar. And he's flying at him. You have to ask yourself, is this a good news story or a bad news story, right? Because here he is flying at him. And Isaiah's, and my thought is if I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, you're right. You should actually burn me up because I've trespassed into a place I don't belong. And that's probably what you're coming to do. And And then he says, he laid it on my mouth. Remember where he said all of his, like his sin was concentrated in his lips. He laid that, coal, that hot coal on my lips. And when it touched my lips, um, it's the angel says, thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged. And all of a sudden, this experience that he didn't expect to happen, happened when he was in there. Um, in temples, in the ancient temples, and you remember this from when we were in Exodus and Leviticus, altars represent 
um, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They represent the manifestation of the love of God. And what happens in this place, in this holy place, is Isaiah has an experience with that white hot love of God. Um, he has an experience, an encounter with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, with the atonement of Jesus Christ, and his sins are purged from him. And all of a sudden it says, he says this, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Isaiah, here am I, send me. And it's interesting that like when he walked in, he was like, I do not belong here at all. But once he has an experience with the love of God, mm -hmm. He now starts speaking the same things Jesus even spoke, you know, in the pre-mortal world. Everything's changed. Now, all of a sudden, he has this confidence where he just says, like, send me. Like, I have a I'm message. Gonna, I have a message. And my message is going to be what happened to me while I was in here, where I thought I was an outcast, where I thought I didn't belong, um, where I thought my problems, you know, would have chased God away from me instead of him coming, you know, to me. And he just, there is, this is a chapter that just kind of is this, um, it's almost like one, it's showing one person's experience in this like community that Isaiah is talking mm -hmm. to, where he's just like, but because it happens on this individual level. And the reason I really love this is because when I was reading it one day, I just, in my mind, I just saw a sacrament meeting room. And I think this is maybe the benefit of trying to read, connecting yourself, reading with the spirit as you'll start being taught lessons and and I saw a sacrament meeting room and I remembered times that I'd walked into a sacrament meeting and thought, I actually don't belong here. And uh, I don't know if God would want me here after, you know, some of the choices that I've, I've made. And then to have sat there and had um, angels come from the altar with symbols of the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I touched them to my lips and could almost hear the angels saying, your sins are, are purged. And, and just the experience, like he has this holy redemptive experience. And, and uh, I don't ever read this without thinking of a sacrament meeting or mm. a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the, with the love of God. And, and I think that's what can come as we try and like, it can be catered mm. to us, you know, as, as we read and the experience we can, it can be really personal yeah, and I love, I love when he says, um, go out, because he's like, here I am, send me, what should I do? And I love when he's like, go, because the people hear, but they're not understanding, and they see, but they're not perceiving. And do you ever feel like you live in that world right now where you're like, I'm trying to tell you about Jesus, and I know you hear me, but you're not understanding me tell you. And, and you see what's happening, but you're not perceiving that he is in this. And I, I love that he's like, you got to go out there and try and help them understand with their heart. Because if they can, they could convert and be healed. And then I love when Isaiah says to him, how long will I do it for? And, and you love that it's not like a two-year mission. Or you're not like, you're going to be in this calling for five years or for seven years or whatever. He says to him, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. Like until there is no one else to tell the story to, you keep talking until then. And I just love the thought of that. Like you, you go out and tell how your life has been touched by Jesus Christ, changed by Jesus Christ, the miracle you have experienced in Jesus Christ, and you keep telling that story until there's no one left to tell that story to. And that's what the book of Isaiah is. Like I, Isaiah 6 is his, sto it's his conversion story, essentially. It's his like, you know, so the rest of it, when he's talking to Babylon, he's talking to Israel, when he's talking to Judah, when he's talking to anybody, he's telling them about his story. He was like, this is what God is like. This is how he can intervene in mm -hmm. your life. This is the change that can make. This is why you don't want to pursue these other things. This is why this choice is better. He's talking from his own personal experience. Yeah, you know, and if you were teaching this part of the lesson, then you might ask the class, what, what is yours? Yeah. What is the experience where 
he entered into your story. What is that yeah. story? And then what would you want to say about it to someone else, mm. right? Like what would you... Yeah. He's got 60 some odd chapters of what he wants to say, you know, and you can just have one line, but yes. what is it you would say? Yeah, and I love that because I think we need more of us that are like that. I um, met a woman on Saturday night who said to me, um, I was taking a break from church. And then she had heard something we had taught about Jesus. And she said, I'd never thought about Jesus like that before. Mm. And it made me intrigued. And now that I have been studying more, I, I want to introduce people to that this. Jesus, that this one that I am discovering now in my story. And I had said to her, oh, I'm so glad you didn't leave because we need more people like you. We need the people who are figuring out how to discover Jesus within a story where Jesus wasn't. That's who we need right now. And once you have figured out how to do that, you need to start teaching other people how to do that. This is, we live in a world that is walking away from religion, uh, every religion. And so for me, it's these people who have that moment where they have tasted Jesus to say, okay, I have tasted Jesus now, and this is what it looked like for me, might give hope to someone else who is hearing but not understanding and seeing but not perceiving, it might give them hope. Yeah, and isn't that interesting that like that angel comes flying at him with the hot coal? And in my mind, Isaiah's like initial thought is like, I'm a, he gonna burn me up, <laughs> you know? And then for him to realize like, wait, that's not what he's like. What I thought you were like, mm is not what you are actually like. Yes. You know? Mm -hmm. Who knows what idea he walked into there with? I mean, he walked into the idea of like, I don't belong. And it's like, yes. actually, you not only belong, we need, need you, you, you know? And yeah. that difference that can happen yeah, you know, that's with, so it, with all of us, so. So see how much you are about to love Isaiah for the next four weeks <laughs> after this. <laughs> so many good, good things. Good stuff, okay. Next yeah. week, Isaiah part two. See you then. <laughs>